tonight we'll be looking at um, Psalm 24, the King of Glory. Hey, Amen. It's good to be here. Last week I was in the Dominican Republic. Um, um, I want to say suffering for Jesus, but I went to do a wedding over there last week and um, had a fabulous time and then came home really sick. So um, um, that's my story about going to the Dominican Republic last week. But I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm glad for what God is doing in and through our church as it relates to the book of Psalms. Tonight, as we look at Psalm 24, you remember Psalm 22 a few weeks ago? It kind of reminds us of points to the Lord's grace in dying for us, and thank God he died for us. And then the 23rd Psalm that we talked about last week explains his goodness and caring for us. God is a very caring God. And tonight, this song is going to re, um, remind us or reveal to us his glory in coming for us in this king of glory. You know, this is one of my favorite um, psalms. Um, of course, the 23rd psalm is my favorite psalm, um, but this is one of my favorite psalms as well, just talking about the king of glory. I think we have the best king ever, the king of the universe, our Lord and Savior. I mean, we have the best king ever. And tonight as we go through this, um, I just want you to reflect on your king and say, you know, thank you, Lord, for just being our king, for being such a good, good father to us and all of that. Some writers believe that Psalm 24 is reflective upon 2 Samuel chapter 6. Um, some writers believe it's reflecting on 2 Samuel um, chapter 6. And the reason why they're bringing that up is because David, when he took over all of Jerusalem, you know, he was over Hebron for seven and a half years, and then um, he took over um, um, the rest of Israel, the 33 years that makes up his 40 and a half years of his reign. Um, the first thing David wanted to do was bring worship back to the heart um, of, of all of Israel. And, you know, David had some challenges in bringing the worship back when he tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. You remember what happened? Um, he didn't quite read up on what he needed to do. So as they were bringing the ark back, um, the ark was um, getting ready to fall, and the young man, Uzzah, reached out, and he grabbed the ark, and what happened? He fell dead. Wait a minute. God, he was doing a good thing. Why would you kill him if he was doing a good thing? He might have been doing a, a good thing but he was still disobedient in that he was touching the ark of God. And David, David, David felt some kind of way. Lord, it's on me. And of course it was on David. But David spent some time reading up and studying how to properly carry the ark. And after 90 days, he came back and he carried the ark um, all the way to Jerusalem. They say he danced and he danced and he danced. I think he was on Soul Train because he danced until his clothes came off. Okay, y'all just dated yourself if y'all know what Soul Train is now. Work with me. <laughs> but he danced until his clothes came off. And do you remember his wife at the time? She looked, um, some people say Michael is Mikhail. She looked out of the window and saw this, you know, her father was king, now her husband is king, and she's looking out of the window like, you're making a fool of yourself. And um, do you notice what happened to her? She was not able to bear children. She was, she was bearing all of her days. She wasn't able to carry on the bloodline for David. Because um, what, what, a, what, a, what a mighty scene when a man of God, David, um, um, danced his priestly garments off as he stood before the people bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. Restoring worship to the heart of the city. A -a Amen. Well, we have here in Psalm 24 this whole idea of a great, the great and sovereign God. Not a great and sovereign God, but the great and sovereign God. There's no one like him. There's no one above him. Well, let me read verses 1 and 2 for us here in um, 
Psalm, um, Psalm 24. It says, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Now, forgive me, this is where I get real King james with you all. I say the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. I like that translation right there, but just forgive me. The, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And that's what you have in verses 1 and 2. What a mighty opening scene. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, if I, if I jump over to the King James as I explain verses 1 and 2 to us a little bit, don't, don't, don't hate me for it tonight. It's just my childhood VBS days coming out because this was our verse in VBS. Because we always had to say, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You know, David was a noble. He was a very successful king. But his kingdom was relatively small in comparison to some of the other kingdoms around the world, such as the Egyptian kingdom, such as the Assyrian kingdom. Um, they were greater. But David knew that even though the Egyptian kingdom was bigger, the Assyrian kingdom was bigger, there was no one's kingdom bigger than our great God's kingdom. A -a 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 Amen. David knew that the Lord Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, was the God of all the earth. Our covenant-keeping God was the God of all the earth. I love it how he follows up here, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And then watch this. He says quickly, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. It's not just the world, it's the content also belongs to him as well. So whether we're talking about um, the harvest or whether we're talking about life or whether we're talking about worship, whether we're talking about the wealth of the world, all of it belongs to God. Do you know you, that everything that you think you own belongs to God too? Oh, man, this is the great point right here. Let me stop right here. Everything that you think you own belongs to God as well. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, all the content, everything that dwells within. God has sovereign rule over everything. And he makes this clear. I like it what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Um, Satan thought he owned some things. But quickly he let Satan know that, Satan, you don't own anything as it relates to this. That God owns everything. Here's Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26. And then again in verse 28, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He repeats this. He quotes this again. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's the principle that God owns everything. Um, he wants to establish the principle that there's no food in itself unclean um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. God owns everything. He's fully in charge. Um, and the, the first thing I just want to remind you of is the world and all of its contents belong to God. That's a good word for us tonight because it can kind of remind us, hey, God still owns everything, and God still owns me. In verse 2, it reminds me that he's creator God, creator God. And what do I mean by creator God? You remember when we were studying chapter, oh, excuse me, Psalm 8 and then Psalm 19? This quickly lines up with Psalm 8 and Psalm 19 to remind us that the God that we serve is creator God. God is in charge. He's number one. He's sovereign. He's great. He's over everything. Can I get an amen tonight? Yeah, he's over everything. Now, because of sin, uh, sin has torted things um, as we know it. But we know that one day our creator, God, is going to set everything free. And we know this because of Romans 8. God's going to set everything back in order. And as I read Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23, he reminds me quickly that our God is fully in charge. I hope you believe that tonight because I believe that with all of my heart, that we have a God that's a creator. 
And, and, and here's how good that these verses teach us. Um, even when it relates to the seas, it's God who founded the seas. It's God who established that. I don't know how far David would have traveled in his day. Maybe 50 miles, maybe 100 miles. Maybe the only sea that he's only seen is the Mediterranean Sea. I don't know if he saw the Indian Sea, the Black Sea. I don't know if he saw the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. But it doesn't matter. David knew that all the seas of the world, God established it. God was in charge. He established it, among, uh, um, um, it upon the waters. We know that David realized that even Genesis 1 it was God that was creator of everything. And on the third day, when he created the sea, God was the one who did that. And, 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 and God is not a deist. We don't have to have a deist approach to God. God didn't just start it and let it go. God, God founded the sea. He established things, and he's still watching over things. He's still providing. He's still protecting. He's still watching out for, that's my country way of saying it, he's still watching out for everything. God established everything. You know, that is so good about David. He knew that it wasn't an engineering mar marvel of his day. He knew that God had established things. You know, as we, even when we reflect back on um, Psalm 8, we realize that God is in control of everything. God established everything. Now, this is why I make it a Sunday morning sermon just for a moment. Do you realize everything in your life God established? There's nothing that's going on in your life that God didn't bring to be. The earth is the Lord's. Everything was found. God did it. You know, this is probably a great place to stop and say this. In Colossians chapter 1, it reminds us of how great God is in control. Everything was made for him and by him and for his good pleasure. God is in control. He's sovereign over everything. You know, um, there have been times in my life I forgot God was in charge. Anybody ever forgot God was in charge before? Okay, I wasn't the only one. And when you forget God is in charge, you know what you try to assume? You try to assume you're in charge. Now come close. How did that work out for you? Did that, did that work out for you pretty good? Didn't work out for me either. One time I thought I was in charge. Mm -mm. There have been times I thought money made me feel like I was in charge. Okay, am I the only one? Don't look at me like that. Has your money ever made you feel like you're in charge, especially on payday? You feel like you're in charge until everything broke down to the point. My check didn't cover everything that broke down. Y'all ain't talking to me tonight. I ain't even in charge of that. Lord, I want to be in charge of something. No, the best thing I can do is say, Lord, I'm a steward of what you've given me. I'm not in charge of anything. You know, I was reading today, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, I was reading verses 1 through 5, and, and Paul lets us know there that we're stewards, that we're managers. That, that's the best. Thing. We're not owners. We're stewards. We're managers. I, I said, Lord, can I, can I at least own something? I want to own my car. And it looked like Paul said, read the verse again. You're a steward. You're a manager. And then he lets me know that I'm not even able to judge myself. Because I'm so blinded by what I do. I think what I do is right. You're a steward and you're a manager. Lord, help me be the best steward and help me be the best manager that I can possibly be. Oh, the reason why I don't mind telling y'all about my failures as it relates to that is because, Lord, um, help us all to be the best stewards and help us all to be the best managers that we can possibly be. Anybody ever want to do the right thing but the wrong thing came up? Okay, I need five people to know what I'm talking about. You want to do, thank you, dear brother. You raise your hand so quickly. Want to do the right thing <laughs> but the wrong thing comes up? Kind of reminds me that I need a Lord that 
He's in control because he created me. He's sovereign. He's in control. He's number one. Well, let's move on from this point before I get stuck there. And let's move down to verse 3, where he says, he, um, Who may ascend into the holy hill of the Lord? Wow. Where in the world did that question come from? Because who's going to be received by this great and sovereign God? Who's going to be able to hang out with this great and sovereign God? I'm, I'm glad you asked, and, and that's why we're bringing it up tonight. He says, um, who can ascend into the, to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy um, place? And then in verse 4, it says, he who has clean hands and pure hearts, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and who has not sworn deceitfully. Can, 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 I read, can I read verse 4 one more time? Because maybe, maybe you think you're qualified, so I want to make sure that you see verse 4 one more time, and, and you know that I'm talking about you too. He who has clean hands. Do you always have clean hands? Y'all are supposed to say no. You're supposed to say yes, we have clean hands. Do you always have a pure heart? Who has not lifted his soul to falsehood? Who has not sworn deceitfully? Every time I go over these verses, it gives me chills. Because I realize how badly I fall short. Am I okay to tell you all that tonight? That just sometimes I just fall short. Now, I say that not giving myself an excuse. I promise you I'm not trying to fall short. But just to be honest with you, sometimes I fall short. You should ask my wife sometime, do I fall short? She sent me to the store the other day to get something. I got everything but what she asked me to get. She said, how in the world you were gone that long and you didn't get what I asked you to get? I said, well, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. Ask my kids, do I fall short? Ask my boss, do I fall short sometimes? No, no, no. Just ask me, do I fall short sometimes? Because sometimes I'm trying to keep it all together by myself. Well, here's, here's how he starts the question. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Now, he's sovereign, and we know he has ownership of the earth. We, 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 we agree with that, right? We believe that even though there's other big kingdoms, we can talk about the Assyrian. We can talk about um, the Egyptian kingdom. We can even move to the book of Daniel. We can talk about the Babylonian kingdom. We can talk about the Persian kingdom. We can even talk about the Greek. I love the movie 300. Anybody like the movie 300 beside me? Do you remember at the end of the movie when all those warriors were coming out? Man, I thought I was one of those warriors. I stood up myself. Y'all missing my point? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there have been some big kingdoms, some big dynasties, but nobody's bigger than our great God. And then, then he, he realizes that, and David wondered exactly, exactly who had the right to stand before our great God. Who has the right? Um, now, this is not about you getting in shape to climb a mountain. This is... Who's spiritually right to come before our great God? Who's able, and the reason why I know it's not about climbing the mountain is because he asked the question, who can stand in this holy place? This place that's been consecrated, this place that's holy, this place that has, you, um, has the right to stand before God at his holy temple in this holy place. You know that question? You know, lots of people, um, in, especially in 2024, don't ask who has the right to stand in this holy place. You know the question we asked in 2024? How can I be happy? How can I live my best life now? The question still remains, who can stand in this holy place? 
who can stand, who can come before our great God? Not who can, not how can I be happy? Because you can be happy. This is so inappropriate for me to say in the pulpit. You can still be, un, you can still be happy and not be in right relationship with God. A -a -a Amen. You can be rich and not be in the right relationship with God. Yeah, yeah. You can have all the material possessions and not be in the right relationship with God. So here's how he answers the question in verse 24. He reminds me of the person who has clean hands. And this is not just going to the bathroom and washing your hands. The priest's ears would have probably perked up at this point. It's not about hygiene. It's about a pure heart. It's about your, your heart and your hands being right before God. Who has the right, the right hands, the right heart? Your, your hands refer to your actions. Your heart refers to your intentions. Who has the right hands? So, sometimes people have done things and their actions said one thing, and they said, that was not my intention. There's still some tension between your heart and your hand, or your hand and your heart. You have to have the right actions, and you have to have the right intentions as it relates to this text. For the person who wants to sin, that wants to have right standing before God, you have to have clean hands and a pure heart. There have been times in my life where I thought I had the right, I had clean hands, but the action didn't come out right. And I've had to say, Lord, I'm sorry about that. What about you tonight? How's your hands tonight? Your hands clean? David, come here, David. Talk to me for a second. Has your hands always been clean, David? David said, well, I tried. And, 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 and I didn't kill anybody. But I had somebody in my camp by the name of Joab. Joab would take him out. I knew what he was doing, but, you know, I tried to, you know, let Joab be Joab, and I tried to do my thing. David, really? How about when it came to, to a lady by the name of, excuse me for a second, I think her name is Bathsheba. I mean, he stole another man's lamb, stole another man's wife, had him killed, covered it up, married her. And went on about his business. And nobody said anything. But that little ver that last verse in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel still gets to me. Y'all want to hear what it says? But the thing that he did displeased the Lord. The Lord saw it. Um, brothers and sisters, it's not just what man sees. It's what God sees. Oh, I'm preaching better than your amen. You got to have clean hands. That's what we say in the African-American church. I'm preaching better than your amen. But anyway, um, you have to have clean hands and a what? Pure heart. And then he presses this. Can I press it a little bit further? You haven't lifted your soul to idols. I know no one in Calvary Chapel has ever, 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 never lifted their soul to an idol. Matter of fact, um, this one is accepted by God because they reject idols, uh, idolatry in his actions, but especially in his soul. You know what? There's so many things we put ahead of God. Can, can I just name a few real quick? Well, it's football season. I'm at the wrong church. And uh, it depends on who's your college football team. Now, if you have USC, of course, you're not, you're not, you're not worshiping USC. It won't be long before we get back to our winning, our losing tradition. But if you got some of these other teams, some of y'all missed what I just said. You know, someone asked me just the other day, they said, who's your team? And I said, Dallas. Uh, I'm, I'm a cowboy fan for life. It's America team. And um, thank you, brother. They said, you're used to losing then, aren't you? I got an attitude with them right then. I was going to share the gospel with them until they told me that. 
Y'all praying with me? <laughs> Sometimes we idle. Y'all still with me? Not only do we idle our sports team, sometimes we idle how much money we make. Not at Calvary Chapel. We don't, we don't, we never would idle. That would never be one of our idols, how much money we make. Because we know all the money we have belongs to God. I said, we know all the money we have belongs to God. <laughs> well, it's a rough church to preach in on Wednesday night. No, it's not about our money. For so many, I'm going to bring up another idol that I've struggled with in the past. Can I tell you another idol I've struggled with in the past? Can y'all handle this one? Sometimes I idolize my kids. They're just the smartest kids in the world. No, they're not. But to me, they're the smartest kids. They're the most beautiful kids. They really have it going on. And you know what? The Lord said, would you give your kids to me? No. You may want to kill one of them. You remember? Somebody else gave him their kid, and he said, "Go no, I'm not going to sacrifice my kid before you, Lord. And Lord reminds me, don't ever let your kids come before me. <sighs> What's your idol tonight? Have you ever lifted your soul to an idol? Yeah, you're still in church. You still serve in church. Oh, this is going to get so mean. I shouldn't say this in church. I should wait to after church when I'm shaking hands to bring this one up. But I'll bring it up now, and y'all can talk about me after church. Sometimes serving in church can become an idol because we're getting our needs met instead of bringing glory to God. Okay, that was a lot better than y'all, amen, but anyway. And, and, and according to this text, um, for this person who wants to ascend, who wants to stand before God, I'm still in the text, who is not um, sworn deceitfully. Man, that, that gets kind of personal there. Why would he even bring that up? Because the words we speak are a good indication of the state of our hearts. Have you ever spoken something and you had to wonder where that come from? At the heart of every problem is a problem with your heart. At the heart of every problem is a problem with your heart. I don't know why I said that to you, honey. I don't know why I swore or used profanity or cursed you out. I would never do that. At the heart of every problem is a problem with the heart. Y'all with me there? When you start to enjoy that, 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 those loose words, those rotten words. It's gotten quiet in here tonight. Y'all still working with me? The good intentions that really doesn't, doesn't really go anywhere. You know, if I had way more time, I'd spend some time just diving into Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, and just helping us understand that whole inner man piece. You know, the Pharisees worked on outward, outward appearance. But guess what we need to work on? We need to work on our hearts. Lord, creating me a clean heart, renewing me, a, oh, that's another song that's coming up, renewing me a right spirit before you. You know, David, David really wanted us to understand. The Spirit of God really wanted us to understand that one who makes deceptive promises finds no welcome as it relates to God. How are we doing tonight? Then, then he flips it, <laughs> still on the same point. I love how, he, how Psalm 24 really goes on to verse 5. He says, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Um, verse 6, this is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. It's almost like take a moment at the end here and let's reflect upon this. You know, verse 5 is just full of pregnant potential because he says the promises of blessings to the righteous man, to the righteous woman. That person who is righteous, you get the favor of God on your life. You get the blessing of God on your life. 
You know, I, I, I haven't always gotten it right, and I still don't always get it right. But thank God I've seen God's favor and blessings on my life. God has blessed me because I try hard to get it right before him. And like David, when things were brought to my attention, I quickly apologized. I quickly asked God for his forgiveness. Lord, I want to be right with you. Can I ask you a question tonight? Do you want to be right with him? Do you want to chase him with everything you got? Do you want to make sure you're not uh, uh, being deceitful or, or, or having idols before him? Do you want to ask God, is there anything that you need to remove from? I, I, I took a group of people a few weeks ago to see this new Christian movie that just came out, The Forge. And uh, any, anybody in here seen The Forge yet? A few people you've seen The Forge? And they were moved. I'm going to be a spoiler alert right now. I, don't, don't be a spoiler. You said stop? You know the illustration I was about to use then, right? Okay. I won't, don't, won't be a spoiler alert. You need to go see the movie so I can bring it up next week then. Because there's a certain scene in that movie that you have to get rid of some idols that really blesses my soul. And I sat there and said to myself, man, I got to do some work. Because I got to make sure that I don't have anything between me and God. A amen. So he said for this person, they're going to receive the blessings of the Lord. The Lord cares about the, our behavior. He, he, he cares about our conduct. He cares about our moral compass. He wants to reward those who honor him. God likes to reward those who honor him. If you honor God, God likes to take care of you. Amen. Does, does that mean your life will never be challenged? No, your life will be challenged sometimes. But guess what? God loves to face challenges with you to show you how he'll take care of you in the midst of the challenge of life. And, and, and text says here, and this person shall receive blessings. Wow. You know, I'm thinking about Obed-Edom in the book of Psalms, excuse me, in the book of um, Samuel, when they had to leave the Ark of the Covenant there while David was learning how to serve, how to take the Ark of the Covenant. You know what happened in Obed-Edom's house? That everything, was, everything began to prosper, was blessed because the Ark was there. Man, when the presence of the Lord shows up, man, there's blessings everywhere. The Lord loves to pour out blessings on his people, those who are righteous, those who are in right standing with him. And, of course, you have the righteousness of the God of their salvation. Wow. Um, you can trust God in this. Of course, verse 26 is equally as cool. A description of the blessed and the righteous person is given here. How do they look? He says, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, those who seek his face. He's saying, wow. He, 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 re, he repeats it here to let, let us know that, you know what? The Lord loves those who are, who are seeking him out. You know, if you seek him, he shall be found. You know, this was David's way of identifying God's covenant people. You know how you know you're part of God's covenant people? Because you're seeking him out. You want to be near him. The blessed and the righteous ones have entered into covenant with God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I want to be one of those blessed people. But I don't want to be blessed in material things. And, and my heart be so cold toward God. I'd rather be poor in material things and my heart is in the right place with God that I'm ready to receive just to be close to him forever and forever and forever. <clears throat> where, where have we been tonight? Well, we, we've talked about the great and the sovereign God. We, we talked about received by the great and sovereign God. Who, who does he receive? These people with clean hands and these people with clean hearts. But let's, let's, let's end our time tonight with talking about receiving the great king. 
How do we receive a great king? Well, some of you remember when that first child was coming to the house. Man, you had to paint, paint the room. You had to get everything. Am I at the right church saying this? You had to get the room ready. You had, you had to put the decorations up. Everything had to be perfect because that first child was coming home. I mean, um, I mean, it's not, it's not a week-long project. It's a six-month-long project. Just getting ready, getting everything ready for this new arrival to come. How much time do you spend preparing for the Lord to take residence in your heart and in your home? You know, I think he's the most important guest that you will ever have. And, and of course, receiving the great king, here's what he says here. He said, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, um, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. And if, if those words don't give you goosebumps, you can, go, you can go on home tonight as I finish this up. Um, he reminds us that, first of all, that God is creator God. That he's, we, we see his glory in creation. We see his glory in salvation. He's blessing his people. That's what we just saw. But we also see his glory in the kingdom. These verses probably were spoken first when David took that Ark of the Covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 6, to the, to the center of, of Jerusalem, when he wanted to reestablish worship of the true and living God, when he wanted to reestablish a monotheistic culture, get rid of your idols, we're going to just serve God. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A amen. You know, when he rode into Jerusalem, Jesus came in with humility and tears. But when he comes again, he will come in great power and great glory. Do you believe that tonight? I believe that with all of my heart. So he starts out with this section with lift up your heads, O gates, O ye gates. You know, he wants the reader to declare the greatness of God. And in that second section there, he wants him to know, hey, man, how man can come into a relationship with this great God. Be in right relationship with him. Thirdly, he wants us to know, welcome God into his people by opening your gates. Take the locks off of your gates and say, Lord, you're welcome. You know, um, I was at someone's house a few months ago. And they had a welcome at the door. And uh, it, the most beautiful mats you'd ever seen. I, I told my wife, I have to get me one of those mats. I mean, it was welcome. I mean, the mat made you feel welcome. But when they opened the door, they didn't make you feel so welcome. Y'all praying with me tonight. <laughs> Some of us, we look welcoming because we're at church. We look like got good mat. But we're not so welcoming when the doors open. Can I ask you a question tonight? This is a Sunday morning question. Do you have your gates open wide for him tonight? Because if your gates are open, the king of glory will come in. Mm. You know, with the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant, they had to open the gates. With the Lord in your heart, you have to open the gates. You know, I could keep going back and forth with um, 2 Samuel 6, but you can read that on your own time, verses 11 through 18. But I just want to remind you that the king of glory wants to come in tonight. He wants to be welcomed in your heart. He wants to be welcomed in your life. He wants you to put him in the right place in your life. Put him on the throne of your heart tonight. You know, um, the king of glory will meet with his people when approached correctly and the doors are open unto him. The 
king of glory wants to meet with you tonight. I want you to know that. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Um, this is amazement to me tonight. He is the king of glory. He is mighty in battle. His openness to man doesn't diminish his glory nor his might. He, you have the, the, the sovereign of the universe that will meet with you if you open your gates. You have the sovereign of the universe that will meet with you if you say, come on in. And it doesn't, doesn't diminish at all who he is or his strength or his power or his might. You are with me here. And then he repeats it. Live up your heads, O ye gates. You everlasting doors. That's what the King James says. He says, and the Lord and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. I believe this with all my heart tonight. He is the king of glory. Are you going to let him come in tonight? Are you going to let him reside in your life tonight? Are you going to let him be number one in your life tonight? Get rid of your idols. So you have a great and sovereign God. That's what our lesson is about tonight. A great and sovereign God. You have, we, he's sovereign because he made you. He created you. You have the great and sovereign God in verses 1 and 2. You have, you have this received by this great and sovereign God. Who can ascend to him? Those who have clean hands and those who have clean hearts. Tonight, if your hands are dirty, your actions, your heart is impure tonight, ask the Lord to take your heart, take your hands and dip it into his, that your heart and hand may become more like his. Amen tonight. And not only who can be received by him, but also who can receive him. The people that have their gates open. You're ready for him. You've been preparing for him. Lord, come on in. I want to be with you. And tonight, don't let anything keep you from allowing the Lord to have rule and reign in your life to open the gates of your heart. To say, Lord, you're welcome here. You're welcome here in my life, Lord. Now, I would be remiss to tell you this if I sit down without telling you this. If you have sin in your life that you need to um, say, Lord, don't try to clean up your sin and then come to him. Submit your sin to him and come to him. Lord, I need your help with this. Help me with this. Help me. Forgive me of this. Help, Lord, do a work in me and through me in order that I may receive you and in order that you may receive me. And watch this. When the king of glory shows up, he'll turn your life around.